I'm going to tell the story of the thief of always, and as I go through it, I'm going to uncover the hidden layers that are very obvious once you see them, but a lot of people don't see it. So Thief of Always is a children's book that was written by Clive Barker. Clive Barker is the guy who wrote the story that inspired Hellraiser, you know, the, the pinhead monster, the Cenobites. He also wrote the story that inspired the movie Candyman. These are horror movies. He's known for, for a sort of a bizarrely sexual horror with BDSM kind of overtones. And honestly, that was when I was first getting red pilled. I was, I, I wanted to know what Thief of Always was about because I wanted to make sure that it wasn't yet another deranged sodomite attempting to pervert the youth. And it's not, it's the exact opposite of that. Thief of Always is a fable that warns against that exact thing. So, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. This is the cover to the graphic novel version of The Thief of Always. So there's a there's a creepy man and he's got this disingenuous predatory smile and reflected in his glasses is the face of a young boy who looks scared, confused. What do you think this book is about? So, even before I read Thief of Always, just reflecting on Clive Barker's work, the, the, um, the, the, almost like, it has a traumatized sexual kind of energy to it, this dark sexual energy. I figured that something must have happened to him when he was young. It's, it's not a, it, it takes no great, um, leap of logic to see that, you know, there is no born this way. That's just a lie. And, you know, if you look up Clive Barker, he's, he's gay. He, he talks about dating older women when he was a teenager, which is kind of a tip off that something happened, right? Uh, which isn't to say that Thief of Always is only about sexual trauma and abuse. It's, it's essentially a treatise on the nature of evil. It's, it's remarkably accurate describing what evil is, how it operates, how it recruits. So, and whether I would want children, my children, reading this, if I had children, I don't know. A Thief of Always is creepy. It's disturbing. It's heart-wrenchingly tragic. It's a beautiful story. And th there's a certain innate understanding of Christianity, what I would consider to be true Christianity in it. And it just, it rings true. Uh, it's probably Clive Barker's most honest work. I don't know that for a fact. I haven't read anything else he's done. Um, but here we go. It's his thief of always. Okay, so I have to do this in installments. It is what it is. So the thief of always begins with a chapter called Harvey Half Devoured. And Harvey Swick is our protagonist. He's about 10 years old. Here's an illustration of Harvey that begins the book. All these black and white illustrations were drawn by Clive Barker, by the way. So, Harvey Half Devoured. Harvey is sitting in his bedroom, and it's February. He's very bored. It's raining outside, and he's kind of has this childlike fantasy of being so bored that he is bored to death. And a detective comes along and investigates his death and concludes that Harvey Swick was swallowed by the great gray beast of February. So right away we see that Harvey is a very creative, bored kid. Okay. Uh, Clive Barker writes, The promise of summer was so remote as to be mythical. February is one of those very boring months for kids. It's in between Christmas and the summertime. And all of a sudden... There's a great gust of wind, and in through Harvey's window flies a man who introduces himself as Rictus. This is Clive Barker's illustration of Rictus. He's also on the graphic novel cover that I showed you. And Rictus, by the way, means a fixed grimace or grin. And he's wearing a fancy suit. He has a wide grin with two perfect rows of gleaming teeth. And he gives off a kind of flatulent odor. So Harvey's not sure who this guy is, and he has a lot of questions, but Rictus reveals that he was flying around, and he heard Harvey sighing a, a mile off. 
So Richt is flying. That's one comparison we can make with Peter Pan. Um, and Richt just plays on Harvey's despair a little bit. And he says, on nights like this, doesn't it seem like there will never be another summer? And he invites Harvey to a place where the days are always sunny and the nights are full of wonders. And of course, Harvey has a lot of questions, but Rictus doesn't really want to answer questions. Uh, he's, he plays a little mind game with Harvey where he says, well, you know, I, if, if you're asking this many questions, I don't have to take you. And Harvey says, oh, no, no, of course, of course I want to go. Rictus, oh, well, I'm being a forgiving sword. I, I can forget that you spoke. Well, I'm not, I'm not guaranteeing anything, but... Uh, this is all a manipulation to get Harvey to want to go to this wondrous place. And Rick just leaves. He flies off into the night. And as he's leaving, he yells back to Harvey, Questions rot the mind. Keep your mouth shut. So this is a very peculiar opening scene. It requires immediate suspension of disbelief. And the reader's response to Rick just is kind of similar to what Harvey's response is, where... It's a little off-putting that he smells like farts and he won't answer any questions. But the reader is in a state of wonder about Rictus the same way that Harvey is, because his entrance into Harvey's life seems so magical. And Rictus impresses Harvey with his flying the same way that an adult would impress a child with their, with their adultness. And, you know, this is no coincidence. Rictus is essentially a, a child predator. And the fact that he's described as having this flatulent odor, um, this is not an incidental detail, and it will come up again. So, Rictus comes back for Harvey a week later, and one of the first things we're told is that Rictus is, pairing, is wearing a pair of bright blue shoes. And he says to Harvey, do you like my shoes? My boss gave them to me. Which is very strange and Definitely a reference to sex trafficking. So, like, the scouts in sex trafficking who, who try to who lure kids into, into the, the work, uh, they'll, they'll wear bright red shoes. So, the fact that Rictus was given shoes by his boss and he's currently luring a child back to this place. Um, okay. And Harvey has questions. He wants to know how many hours of school he'll miss and... Rictus says, well, I'm not here to put on a song and dance for you. I'm a smiler. I just smile. And if folks want to come, they can come. So he's describing a role in sex trafficking. Rictus is a smiler. That's how he lures kids. So Harvey goes with Rictus. And eventually they come to a wall, which is actually made of mist. And they, on one side of the wall where they are, it's, it's February and it's it's gloomy and dreary, and then they walk through the wall, nine and three quarters style, and on the other side, it's a summer day, and up on the top of a hill is the most beautiful house Harvey's ever seen. It's called the Holiday House. So chapter three is called Pleasure and the Worm. Personally, I'm reading into that, but so Harvey is admiring this beautiful house, and as he's walking up the steps to the porch, he thinks, what a fine thing it would be to build a place like this, to say, where there was nothing, I raised a house. This is a glimpse of Harvey, the creator, right? Harvey is this, he has this divine light inside of him. And on the porch, he meets this woman, Mrs. Griffin, who is incredibly old. She has a face and hair like cobwebs. She's the oldest woman Harvey's ever met, but she has a melodious voice. And Harvey hesitates a moment before he crosses the threshold into the house. Because he, he can tell it's a moment of decision. But then he hears a boy laughing inside the house. And he decides to cross the threshold just to see who the boy is that's laughing. And it's this boy, Wendell, who is one of the children living in the house. So Harvey winds up in this situation partly because he wants to make this friend. Um, and Harvey's just blown away by the holiday house. Um, it's, it's a house for adventures. He can, he can picture pirates burying treasure and, and genies on carpets and all of these different adventures that he, that he's imagining. And there's all this food laid out in the kitchen for them that Mrs. Griffin is making. You know, it's, there's hamburgers and pies and just anything that a kid could want. Um, and he notices that Mrs. Griffin, you know, he says... He says, this place is perfect. And she says, nothing's perfect. 
because time passes and the beetle and the worm find their way into everything sooner or later. So she has this strange sadness to her. And then Harvey is introduced to Lulu, who is the other child who lives in the house. And he's told that the house was built by a man named Mr. Hood. So a hood conceals, right? A hood enables someone to hide. And that is the essence of who Mr. Hood is. Um, now there's a certain word choice I want to point out that is, you know, to me, probably not coincidental. When we're introduced to Lulu, she ambles onto the scene and then she ambles off the scene. When we're introduced, when, when Harvey first talks to Wendell, he went, he ambles around a corner. And some of you know what I'm going, where I'm going with this. Um, there is a certain connection between the word amble and pedophilia. So, um, Steven Spielberg is a known pedophile and his, one of his first short films that gained a lot of attention and that put him on the map, so to speak, was called Amblin. And it had all of these coded references to pedophilia in it. And of course, it's, it's, he probably got famous or, or was drawn into the club because he, he did those subtle winks to let people know that he was a pedophile. And, uh, the, the National Association, the National Man-Boy Love Association, which I want to vomit just saying that, you know, it's NAMBLA. And if you rearrange the letters of NAMBLA, you get Amblin. So there's, there's something about that word that is tied to pedophilia. And that's, that's how we are introduced to Lulu and Wendell. So anyway, Harvey goes to bed in the middle of the afternoon. He's tired and Harvey is now part of the, these lost boys, these children that occupy the holiday house, just like in Peter Pan, where in, in Peter Pan, you know, you have the lost boys living in Neverland. So Harvey wakes up the next morning and it's spring. And this is his first full day in the holiday house. And he starts to understand that it's spring in the morning and then it's summer in the afternoon. And he's introduced to some of the cats that live in the holiday house. And one of the cats is named Clue Cat. There's Blue Cat and Clue Cat and Stew Cat. And Clue Cat is eating off the table in the kitchen. And Harvey asks Mrs. Griffin, he's like, can, can he do whatever he likes? Um, and she, she kind of just brushes it off and he goes outside and he, he builds a tree house with Wendell and he notices that for every question he asks Wendell, Wendell kind of brushes it off, just saying, who cares? And they're talking about how Lulu's been acting strangely lately. And Harvey's asking if, Harvey asks if there's a place to go swimming at the holiday house. And Wendell says, yeah, well, there, there is a lake. It's, um, you know, on the other side of the house, but, uh, he, he seems to be a little strange about the lake. And when, it, when he says it, when he asks Mrs. Griffin about it, she says, the fish are poisonous. You don't want to go near the lake. Um, so they're being very strange about it. And again, Harvey goes into the kitchen. And again, he sees that Clue Cat is just helping himself to food that's in the kitchen. He, he jumps onto the counter beside the stove. And before either of the boys could move to stop him, he had his paws up on the lip of one of the pans. Hey, get down, Harvey told him. The cat didn't care to take orders. He hoisted himself up onto the rim of the pan to sniff at its contents, his tail flicking back and forth. The next moment, disaster. The tail danced too close to one of the burners and burst into flames. Clue Cat yowled and tipped over the pan he was perched upon. A wave of boiling water washed him off the top of the stove and he fell to the ground in a smoking heap. Whether drowned, scalded, or incinerated, the end was the same. He hit the floor dead. So this is why Clue Cat is named Clue Cat, because he gives a clue into the nature of the house. This is a house without boundaries. And boundaries are very important for children. And this is, there are obvious parallels here to having your, your boundaries violated as a child before you even know what they are. And Harvey's response is he's crying and he wants to help Mrs. Griffin with the body. And she's very, she's very touched by Harvey's humanity. Whereas Wendell just wants to go outside and eat. He just, he just totally ignores the situation. Between chapters four and five, we are treated. I told you this would come up again. 
We are treated to a very strange image, and there is no explanation whatsoever given for it. Um, here it is. So we have a man gazing into another man's ass. And I, it appears that he is talking to himself, and he's just sort of blissfully smiling. I'm, I'm sorry to show you that, but it's pretty necessary. This is yet another clue into what this book is about, what inspired this book. Um, and there is an inherent narcissism to anal fixation, being up your own ass, right? Even I was reading the day, there's, um, back during witch trials, they believed that one of the acts of becoming a witch was to kiss Satan's asshole. Literally, that's, that was one of the things that they said witches had to do, was to kiss Satan's anus. So there is, there's sort of precedent for this. And this, this also explains why Rictus is described as having a flatulent odor. Um, and then Mrs. Griffin at one point says that he's, he, he's really into his own reflection and his own voice. He's a narcissist, basically. Um, I, I see this as a, a strange depiction of the role that anal sex plays in the lives of empty people. And, you know, as Owen Benjamin has said in the past, anal sex is the ultimate act of nihilism because the asshole is a void where poop comes from and it, it gives off a rotting odor right so you can you can contrast that with actual sex which which creates life it's it's the origin of life so to trade actual sex for anal sex is like the ultimate act of nihilism it's the ultimate act of emptiness it's a void there is an innate narcissism, there's an emptiness to the kind of man who would prey on children. So, after Clue Cat's death, Harvey goes outside and he, you know, it's summer now and he wanders down to where the lake is and he kind of understands why they didn't want him to go there. It's, it's dreary and it's gloomy and Barker writes, this was a place where dead things belonged. And he sees Lulu at the lake and she's gazing into the depths. And he says hello to her, but she runs away. And he's like, oh, wow, Lulu really is acting strange. Um, and then he sees the fish in the lake. And they're these miserable looking things. They're, they're these monstrous, almost as big as he is. And their their eyes are turned up. And they're described as being like the eyes of prisoners in a watery pit. And he thinks to himself, what a life. No sun to warm them, no flowers to sniff at, no games to play. Just the deep, dark waters to circle in and circle and circle and circle. And he wonders to Wendell, why would Mr. Hood have ugly fish like that? Everything else here is so beautiful. And Wendell, who cares? You know, he, he doesn't really care. And as Harvey's uh, walking back to the house, it's becoming dusk and it's becoming autumn at the same time. So the leaves are starting to fall off the trees. This is the way the holiday house operates. When you wake up at springtime, the afternoon it's summer, um, at, at dusk you celebrate Halloween, you go inside for a Thanksgiving dinner, and before you go to bed you open up your Christmas presents. That's every day at the holiday house. And as he's walking to the house, he, he asks aloud to the house, You're real, aren't you? And he swears that he hears in the, in the creak of the floorboards and the dry, rustling leaves, he swear he hears this, the house respond, what do you think, child? And he reminds himself that questions aren't welcome here, and he, he reasons that it feels real, and for now that's enough. So Harvey goes into the house, and uh, him and Wendell pick out Halloween costumes, because it's dusk, it's Halloween, and they go into a costume room. It's full of all kinds of costumes, and there's a, a wall of masks, just floor to ceiling covered in masks. And... Uh, Harvey's really impressed by this, and Wendell explains that Mr. Hood collects masks. If you've done any amount of research into narcissistic personalities, this is really clicking for you. So Harvey decides to go as a vampire. Again, if you've done any research into narcissistic personalities, um, Harvey goes as a vampire, Wendell goes as a hangman. And when they're outside, Wendell plays a trick on Harvey, where he leaves Harvey in the dark, and then he has a, a fake hangman, and uh, Harvey swears that he'll get Wendell back one day for this trick that he played. Chapter 7 is called A Present from the Past. Now this one really hurts. 
this one smarts. So after they're done trick-or-treating, they go inside to eat Thanksgiving dinner. And on Harvey's way upstairs, he runs into Lulu. And Lulu tells him that they'll open Christmas presents before they go to bed. And she says, you should wish for something. And he says, is that what you're doing? And she says, no, I've been here for so long. I've got everything I ever wanted. And he, she takes him to her bedroom and it's full of boxes and dolls and a doll, a beautiful dollhouse. And, you know, dolls, they're this, they're, the, they're like an illusion of a friend, right? So Harvey decides that he's going to test the house's magic by wishing for something that it would be darn near impossible for the house to create. He wishes for an ark that his father made for him when he was very young. And he, he lost it when he was very young. His, his father hand carved like a Noah's Ark and it had little lead animals in it. And it's long since lost. So Harvey goes downstairs and the house is transformed yet again. It's a, it's a Christmas wonderland. It's snowing outside. There's a Christmas tree inside and there's garland, just everything. And he goes to the Christmas tree and he unwraps his gift. And sure enough, it's the Ark. It's, it's an exact copy of the Ark that his father made for him. And Mrs. Griffin's there and she says, Mr. Hood knows every dream in your head. So we'll address the deeper aspects of what the Ark represents later. Uh, I really love this. So that night, Harvey goes to sleep and he dreams he's standing on the steps of his house, looking through the open door into its warm heart. So this is Harvey's first full day at the, at the holiday house. And he dreams that he's looking at the real warm heart of his parents house it's a very Jungian interesting dream so on the seventh day of Harvey's stay at the holiday house he goes down to the lake and he, he wants to see if his ark will float on the lake and he he puts it on the lake and it does float but he he has you know there's just something eerie about the lake that he, he doesn't love and up from the depths of the lake come one of those monstrous fish as if to swallow the ark now why would a fish want to swallow a wooden toy so Harvey falls in the water and he's, he gets out, but he, he doesn't rescue the ark at all. And when he, when he's walking away, you know, it's a, it's a warm summer day, but he can't shake this feeling that there was something about losing the ark to the lake. It was, it was worse than when his, his bike was stolen two years ago. A thief was warm flesh and blood. The lake was not. He feels like he's lost part of himself to a nightmare place. And when he walks away from the lake, he can't suppress the questions and the doubts that he has any longer. Despite all entertainments that the Holiday House supplied so eagerly, it was a haunted place. So the Ark's obvious interpretation, it was created, his, his father hand carved it for his son, right? So in a sense, it represents the inheritance that Harvey could expect back in the world of his family. And, you know, father is the representation for God in the home. So when I say inheritance, I mean a non-physical, spiritual inheritance from his father. So in the days following, the house almost seems to be trying to make it up to Harvey that he lost the ark. It gives him a new bike. There's acrobats performing on the lawn. And then one day, Harvey meets Jive. And Jive is described as Rictus's brother. He says... We're from the same brood, loosely speaking. So it sounds like they're from the same ring of pedophiles, basically. And Jive says to Harvey, you know, you never did get Wendell back for that, uh, that prank you played on you. And Harvey says, yeah, no, I, I didn't. And Jive says, well, what's your favorite monster? And Harvey says, a vampire. And Jive says, okay, come up to the roof and uh, we'll get you all set up to get your, you know, get, get him back. So Harvey goes up to the roof where Jive is, and it's actually where Jive and Rictus live, and Mar is there as well, and Mar is this grossly fat, toothless woman, and she uses her magic to mold Harvey's flesh into a vampire. So he looks like he's been dead for a hundred years, and she gives him wings and everything. And then when Wendell's outside in the dark, Harvey swoops down as a vampire to scare him, and when he's, as he's flying through the sky, he feels like he has superpowers. It feels better than any dream. Harvey knew he'd already had his revenge. Wendell was frightened out of his wits, but it was too much fun to stop now. He liked the feel of the wind beneath him and the cold moon on his back. 
He liked the sharpness of his eyes and the strength of his claws. But most of all, he liked the fear he was causing, liked the look on Wendell's upturned face and the sound of panic in his chest. And Wendell begs for his life. He says, don't eat me, don't eat me. There's another boy here that you can eat. I'm too fat to eat. So he's, he's volunteering Harvey to this vampire who he, who he doesn't realize is Harvey. And Jive is hiding in the bushes, egging Harvey on, saying, listen to him. He would see you dead. Bite him. Drink his blood. And Harvey's tempted, but he resists. He says, this is a game. Jive says, no, no, no. This is an education. So Harvey knows if his place was switched with Wendell, would he really be much braver? So Jive and Mara are very disappointed. They say to Harvey, you could have been one of the greats. And the reason they say that, you know, Harvey has such bright inner light that if he were to betray that light, it would make him extremely dark. Whereas someone like Wendell, who doesn't have that much inner light, if he turned to the dark side, it would be fairly unremarkable. Um, so, but Harvey is a bright soul. And then Jive says to Harvey, he, he goes on this little tangent, he says, all the great powers in the world are blood suckers and soul stealers at heart, and we must serve them, all of us. Serve them to our dying day. So this is great exposition into Jive's character because empty people are often convinced that evil runs the world completely and that they have no agency or free will. They are completely powerless against this evil and against their own evil impulses. It's a sort of learned helplessness where they deny their own free will. And in a sense, you know, Christians will often say that that Satan is the god of this world, but when we say that, it's to separate worldliness from the kingdom of heaven. That's what we mean by that. We don't actually mean that evil runs everything, or that evil gets the last laugh. Really, at the end of the day, God, the creator, your inner creator, gets the last laugh. And even in a way, Satan serves God, you know? I've mentioned the Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus. Uh, it's almost like Satan and God have this deal where Satan... Uh, tests the gold in fire for God. Uh, he serves the natural order that is God. And evil people don't see this. They only see their own inner chaos. They don't see past the illusions of worldly success. You know, because to them, worldly success is everything. They don't see that there's something more, that there's, there's this creator. So Harvey goes inside after this incident and Wendell's at the kitchen table and he says, you're alive, you're alive, I'm so glad. You're my best friend for always. And Wendell means this. And so vampirism is a theme of this book, right? And when Harvey assumes the role of vampire, he feels like he has superpowers. So he, he is tempted by the power, but he doesn't, he refuses it. They, Mar and Jai have tried to make Harvey into the same kind of monster that they are. They tried to get him to betray his friend. This is the ritual of the prey becoming the predator. It's the abused becoming the abuser, the child who was preyed upon by pedophiles, himself becoming a pedophile. This is the cycle of abuse, and Harvey refuses it. That's why he's the protagonist. That's why he's the hero of this story. So the next day, Wendell's wandering around the grounds of the Holiday House, and he is very frustrated, and he confides to Harvey that he wants to leave. He says he's known the Holiday House was, was something was wrong with it for a long time. And it, the, the, the vampire trying to drink, to drink his blood was the last straw he wants to get out. And Harvey goes with him to the mist wall that he originally came through to get to the Holiday House. And the problem is that every time they try to walk through the mist wall, they end up somehow losing their sense of direction, despite the fact that they just have to go straight through it. They go into the wall walking one way. And they somehow get turned around and they end up heading back the way they came toward the holiday house. Now, this is a really clever analogy. If you have experience with somebody who is manipulative, um, you know, a deeply disturbed, dark person, this should sound familiar to you. You know, they, they have a way of sucking you back in. They call it hoovering, right? You set, you might set out to leave and end up staying you might set out in an argument knowing that you're right and you end up apologizing to them. You end up exactly where you started. 
So relationships with dark people are very difficult to leave for this reason. And I'm sure that it's it's the same when you're being preyed on by someone as a child. There's all the tricks and the mind games and the illusions are that much more powerful as a kid. So Harvey goes inside the Holiday House and he finds Mrs. Griffin. And she confesses to him that they are trapped in the Holiday House. They can't leave. And she says to him that Mr. Hood is dead. So Harvey has spent 31 days in the Holiday House. And he decides it's time to leave. So he concocts a plan with Wendell where they're going to meet outside around midnight and they're going to hold on to each other and get through the mist wall no matter what. So he goes outside to meet Wendell and he ends up hearing a voice. Now he tried to get Lulu to come with him, but he couldn't find her. He went to her bedroom and her bathtub was filling up with water, but she was nowhere to be found. So he goes outside to meet Wendell and he hears Lulu calling him. She says, you're leaving, aren't you? He says, yes. And she says, I want to give you something to remember me by, but I don't want you to look at me. And she reaches out and Harvey has his eyes closed and she puts in his hand the lead animals from the ark that he lost to the bottom of the lake. And she runs off and Harvey chases after her because he wants her to come with them. To, to back to the real world outside the holiday house. And he catches a glimpse of her. Her hair had fallen out and her nose disappeared. Her mouth had lost its lips and her blue eyes turned to swiveling silver balls, lidless and lashless. She had begun to transform into one of the fish of the lake. So Lulu's character you know this person in real life, right? This this is the person who has endured trauma who ends up losing their soul to it. It could be somebody who who resorts to drugs and ends up ODing. So the fish in the lake are these children who stayed in the house. This is why losing the ark to the lake feels so wrong to Harvey. Um, remember the way that the lake is described, it's it's a deep nightmare place where the souls of these devoured children circle and circle and circle. They just keep repeating this trauma cycle, this darkness that Mr. Hood puts into these children. This is also why the fish wanted to swallow Harvey's Ark. It's, there are these emaciated souls grasping for something real. They're, they're grasping that, that warm memory that is the Ark. So Wendell and Harvey go through the mist wall and they're holding on to each other so that they can't get turned around. And this is a good metaphor too, because if, if you are in a situation like, like that, where you're, you're being manipulated, you're being gaslit, even if you have just one person who sees it besides you, you can hold on to each other and get out of your situations. Um, so they're walking through the mist wall together and behind them, they see Mrs. Griffin come down the porch steps. And there's this unearthly roar. And it's Karna, who is kind of like Mr. Hood's watchdog. This is the monster, Karna. And Karna's rushing after them to stop them from leaving the holiday house. And Mrs. Griffin grabs Blue Cat and puts him on the stairs. And she says, follow Blue Cat. He has a good sense of direction. So... They follow Blue Cat through the mist wall and Karna's coming after them. But when Karna makes it to the other side of the mist wall, its wings start decaying and the roar becomes like a yelping and, and it just starts, uh, its teeth fall out all over the place and it just starts dissolving. It can't survive on the other side of the mist wall. If it hadn't wanted their flesh so badly, it wouldn't have come after them at such speed and brought this pain and humiliation upon itself. There was a lesson there. Evil, however powerful it seemed, could be undone by its own appetite. We say this in the bear community all the time. Evil always overplays its hand. And this is a fundamental truth on the nature of evil. So when Harvey and Wendell are back in the real world, Harvey pulls out the, the Ark figures from his pocket that Lulu gave him. And he sees them crumble into dust. And he realizes that the Ark itself was an illusion. It was all illusions. So the, the predators, the pedophiles, whoever they may be in this book, 
they pretended that they could give Harvey the sort of real life inheritance, the, the sort of future that his, his real life father promised to him. But it was all illusions. It was all fake. All of, all of their promises were fake. So there's, there's so many parallels here to just the Christian understanding of evil. You know, Satan being the father of lies. So Wendell and Harvey go their separate ways. Uh, Harvey walks home and he knocks on the door of his parents' house. And it's around 6 a.m. when he gets home. And an old man answers the door. And he says, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to wake you. And then there, standing behind this old man, he sees an old woman. She was old, this woman, her hair almost as colorless as her husband's and her face even more aligned and sorrowful. But Harvey knew that face better than any on earth. It was the first face he'd ever loved. It was his mother. And his mom recognizes him right away, but his father asks, how can you be our son? You're a little boy and our son disappeared 31 years ago. So you can spend 31 years of your life distracted by petty pleasures, living out a trauma cycle that you're only barely aware of at the fringes of your consciousness, that you're living out this scarred reality of an almost forgotten trauma. Harvey thought that he could escape the Februaries of this life and he could, he could escape that the dullness and the, the hard times, but there is no escaping that not without paying a terrible price. So another curious overlapping with real life narcissism is that the holiday house keeps the children inside of it in a state of arrested development where they remain children while the world around them ages, which is interesting. It's, it's an interesting comparison. So Harvey remarks to his mom that it's, it's terrible that he lost all that time from his parents just because he was bored. 31 years ago, this is the way it happens. This is the way kids get seized by darkness and that abuse steals time from people. That's why this book is called The Thief of Always. It's a thief of time. So one day Harvey meets up with Wendell and Wendell's upset. He says, I don't like, I don't like this world. It's different than when we left. You know, my, my dad divorced my mom and my mom's fat. And Harvey's parents and the police are trying to find the holiday house, but they can't find it. And Wendell says, of course they can't. The house doesn't want grown-ups; It wants children. So they resolve to go back to the holiday house and to claim the, the time that was stolen from them. So Harvey and Wendell go back to the holiday house and they have no problem finding it. When they get there, Rictus answers the door and he's being very unctuous. And Harvey lies and he says that he came back to get his presents. And Rictus um, runs off to get them for him. And Wendell is instantly seduced by the pleasures of the holiday house. <clears throat> he wants to play in the tree house and he wants to eat the delicious looking food in the kitchen. But Harvey knows it's all an illusion. He knows that it's all dust, just like the, the figures in the ark. So while Harvey is standing in, the, in front of the front door, one of Mrs. Griffin's cats, Stu Cat, is there meowing at him. And Harvey follows the cat down into the basement where he finds a, a wooden coffin with a padlock on it. And he, he breaks it open and inside is Mrs. Griffin and she's beaten black and blue and her hair is torn out in clawfuls. Mrs. Griffin reveals to Harvey that she was the first child in the holiday house. She asks Harvey if, if he's figured out the way the magic in the holiday house works. And Harvey says, it gives you whatever you think you want. And she reveals that when she was a child, she had a cat who died and her father wouldn't buy her a new one. And she wanted a new cat and she wanted a new father. And that's what she found in Mr. Hood, who, um, who made Mrs. Griffin immortal so that she couldn't die. Uh, one last Peter Pan comparison. Mrs. Griffin is a lot like the Wendy of the holiday house. So you have the Lost Boys in Neverland. And, you know, if, if you think about the Lost Boys, the 80s movie, which not so coincidentally is about vampires. Um, the, it's, it's about gay men. The, the, Lost, the Lost Boys are essentially gay men who don't want to grow up. They don't want to assume the role of the man, the father, the husband. 
And just like the kids in the Holiday House, the, the Lost Boys never grow up. And when Peter brings Wendy to Neverland to the Lost Boys, he says to them, I've brought you a mother to tell you stories. And Mrs. Griffin, very much like Wendy, is sort of a proxy mother in the Neverland that is the Holiday House. Um, so she explains that there's such a terrible emptiness inside Mr. Hood. He wants to fill it with souls, but it's a pit. It's a bottomless pit. And then Mar comes out of the shadows of the basement. And Mar is the, the grotesquely fat, toothless woman who transformed Harvey into the vampire. Now this is where the story starts to become very Clive Barker-y. So Mar says to Harvey, you know, you're going to be in a lot of trouble because you let Mrs. Griffin out. Mr. Hood will surely kill you. So let me transform you into something humble. He likes humble things like, like scabby dogs and fleas. She says to Harvey, tell me what's in your heart. Tell me what you dream of so that I can transform you. And this magic is flowing through her fingers. And Harvey responds to her and says, well, what's in your heart? What do you dream of? And she says, I don't dream. So her magic is coursing through her fingers and she grabs on the Harvey and Harvey interlocks his fingers with her, with hers. And, but because Harvey doesn't want to be transformed into anything, her magic has no hold on him. I'm not harming you, Harvey says. I'm just letting you have your dreams the way you let me have mine. I don't want them, she yelled, struggling more than ever. But she couldn't keep the magic she'd intended for him from working on her own skin and bones. Her fat face began to soften and run like melting wax. Her body sagged in its ragged coat, and a greenish gruel began to pour out onto the floor. Oh, she sobbed, you damnable child. What dream was this, Harvey wondered, that was turning Mar to mush? What do you dream about, he asked. I dream of nothing. Ma replied, her eyes sinking back into her disintegrating skull. And that's what I've become. Nothing. Then she was gone, devoured by her own magic. And that's what happens, right? <laughs> that's what happens. So there's a lot of gravy in this scene. You know, there's that notion that evil requires a certain degree of consent. And she was unable to transform Harvey because he didn't want to be anything else. And at the same time, she, she must have consented to her own demise in that way, because as is revealed, her heart is hollow. There's a, there's a nothingness at the center of her heart. And there's no coincidence that, you know, in, in the never-ending story, the bad guy is the nothing. Because evil isn't a thing in and of itself, it's a vacancy of goodness. Evil is a, a hollowness, an emptiness. And Harvey and Mrs. Griffin come up the stairs, and Rictus is waiting for them there, and he, he says to Harvey, how do you like the, the feel of Mars blood on your hands? You're a murderer now. And Mrs. Griffin replies, she was never alive. None of you are. And he says, well, what are we then? And Harvey says, you're illusions. And this is, this is a common theme with empty people, you know, which by the way, pedophiles have extremely high rates of narcissism and NPD, and they, they wear these masks to lure people into their emptiness. And there are even those who say that people like this died in childhood, that their souls were killed when some traumatic event happened to them as children, and that they just go through life as these animated corpses, you know, feeding on the, the warm hearts of good people, like vampires. Vampires indeed. Uh, so I'm not going to go into a ton of detail about the ending, the final showdown that happens between Harvey and the, the predators that, that lurk in the Holiday House. Because I've made my point by now, I think, and their, their deaths are, are somewhat similar. So when, when Jive is dying, he's turning into a puddle of ashes and, and dust. And he, he calls on Mr. Hood to save him. And of course, Mr. Hood does nothing. And this is because evil always betrays its own, right? There's no honor amongst thieves. And of course, Wendell comes out of the kitchen and his mouth is smeared with ketchup. And he says... What's going on? And Harvey's just like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm murdering the, the symbolic representation of pedophiles in the, the most disturbing way possible. So, you know, I get the impression that Clive Barker really likes writing scenes like this. I mean, he's basically known for it, but th there's a certain schadenfreude that you get from it, and they're very creepy 
death scenes, very well written. And you want to watch these pedophiles die. <laughs> you, you do. Just a couple more things about the ending. Uh, in the last chapter, the thieves meet. So Harvey climbs up to the attic and he meets Mr. Hood himself, the Vampire King. And while he's on the walk up there, he's looking for details in the house itself that would allow him to get his mind's fingers beneath the lid of this illusion and lift it up to see what charmless thing lay inside. That's a great line. Boy, do I feel you, Harvey. It's, sometimes it's those little details that go a long way in breaking an illusion. So Harvey finally sees Mr. Hood and he inhabits the attic. He's, he's part of the house itself. And Hood tries to get sympathy from Harvey. He says, well, you know, you're a thief because you're stealing back the time that I stole. So we're both thieves. You know, he plays that kind of game with him. And he says, why not come back and live here peacefully? Harvey says, you stole 31 years from me. I mean, come on. And of course, Hood, Hood says, well, you know, I can help you better understand the dark paths. He, he desperately wants Harvey's light. To turn to darkness. And Harvey replies, so I'll end up feeding on children like you? No thanks. I think, I, I hope that that's autobiographical. And Hood says, well I think you'd like it. You've got a streak of the vampire in you already. And this is a trope in movies, right? Where they always say, oh you and I are not so different, Mr. Bond. You know, that kind of thing. Because evil people always try to point out that little tiny grain of evil that's inside of good men, right? They'll say, oh, because, because you, you cheated on that test once. That, that makes you just as bad as I am for, for raping kids or whatever. Um, and in, in the final showdown with Hood, uh, he says to Harvey, I offer you an easy death, rocked to sleep on a bed of illusions. And the, the house collapses and Hood reanimates himself from the debris of the house. When Harvey tears off Hood's cloak, he sees what Hood is underneath of it. There was no great enchantment at his heart. In fact, there was no heart at all. There was only a void, neither cold nor hot, living nor dead, made not of mystery, but of nothingness, the illusionist's illusion. And Hood is furious that, that Harvey is uncovered, that this, this trick that he's playing, it's, it's not actually this mysterious, grand thing. It's just emptiness. And shrieking with rage, Hood went where all evil must go at last, into nothingness. So there you have it. This whole book is just a masterful metaphor on the nature of evil. It's, it's, this, not, it's this vacancy, right? And the, the book ends with a picture of Clive Barker at the age of 10, right around the age that Harvey is in this book. So this book is really important to me. Obviously, that's why I wrote or did this whole video. It, you know, it, did, it, it took a long time to make this. And it's just, it's such a good description of this evil that people face, you know? And I think now we're living in an age of tremendous illusion. The internet has enabled people to create uh, whole illusory personalities. It, it's, it's a really devastating tool for evil, but also for good, you know? So, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something from it. Um, you know, see, and uh, good, good luck seeing past the illusions in your own life, you know, knowing that sometimes these things that that seem sweet like candy or, or actually just dust, just miserable ashes. All right, take care, folks.